Hi, everybody. We're going to start now. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Nadine Sergeyev, and I've been at the Newark Public Library for about 14 years. I um, want to thank you all for joining us. This will be recorded. I've been here for 14 years. I started working in the reference department, and then I was in charge of the special collections department here, uh, which contains many thousands of works on paper, fine prints, and also lots of rare books. So because I was in the, that position, and when this opportunity came along, um, I was just naturally asked to begin assisting. And then my role evolved over time. And I am now the supervising librarian of the Philip Roth Public Library. Uh, you could type your questions at any time, either if you're watching on Facebook or through the Zoom Q&A and I will get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation should take about half an hour, give or take, and then about half an hour or less for questions. So the Philip Roth Personal Library at the Newark Public Library opened just recently on June 8th, 2021. The Newark born Pulitzer Prize winning author Philip Roth bequeathed his personal collection to the library. And the agreement was that the personal library had to be completed three years after his death. Roth passed on May 22nd, 2018. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about Philip Roth. So if you're watching and you haven't heard of Philip Roth, this is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more. This is intended to be an overview. So you'll hear some basic information about Roth. And after that, I will talk about how we acquired Philip Roth's personal library, about the construction of the room here at the library. And I'll touch on the exhibit a little bit. If you're interested in a more in-depth look at the exhibit or some of the objects, um, then you'll need to stay tuned for future presentations. Um, Philip Milton Roth was born in Newark, New Jersey in the Weequahic section on March 19, 1933. He lived at 81 Summit Avenue with his father, Herman, his mother, Bess, and his brother, Sanford, better known as Sandy. Here's a photo right on the right here uh, that his uncle took in 1943. That's Philip right at the front. Roth's father was an insurance broker and his brother was an artist who worked in commercial advertising. When Philip and Sandy were growing up, Philip recalled that there were four books in the house because the family just couldn't afford to buy them and also because the culture of buying books didn't exist. So either you'd go to the library and you'd borrow your books there, or you could go to the local pharmacy where you can borrow a book for five cents a day. And those four books that Philip recalled uh, were ones that other people had brought his father when he was sick in the hospital. Roth once said, no, there were no books, but there were magazines and newspapers. So there wasn't an absence of reading, but the reading was very much the reading of a working man and my father. So when you ask, were there books in the house? The answer is no. And I think it would be no for almost every kid I knew. And it didn't mean that there wasn't reading going on in the house. And it certainly didn't mean that the highest value wasn't to read. The houses with no books were full of kids who read. And this was an interview with David Remnick from 2003. Roth's parents were Jewish and were second generation Americans. Roth recalled that his grandparents spoke only Yiddish and he didn't understand them. In those days, two out of three immigrant children did not attain the education past the eighth grade, including Roth's father. They'd usually go to work at factories after the eighth grade. During this time, Newark consisted of many different ethnic neighborhoods and the Roths lived in a predominantly Jewish one. They were poor, but growing up, Roth had such a happy childhood, he didn't know that he was poor. The Roth family lived at 81 Summit Avenue on the second floor for a number of years and the Weequahic branch of the Newark Public Library was about a mile away. It was right near Beth Israel Hospital where Roth was born. Beginning in the fourth grade, Roth would walk to the library and visit the children's room. At that time, it was located on the second floor. 
Here he found and borrowed books by Howard Pease, John Tunis, and Howard Fast. A few years later, he started riding his bicycle to the library and loaded up its basket with books. He described himself as a library intoxicated boy. As he grew older, he visited the adult room on the first floor of the Weequag branch, where he found books by Philip Wiley. Roth described the discovery of books as verbal catnip to an eager adolescent's reading hunger. One time, his brother Sandy brought back a school newspaper from art school in New York, and on one page, Roth spotted a recommended summer reading list. You can be sure he read all of those books on the list. It introduced him to Thomas Wolfe, and when he went to the library, he found all of the books on that list on the shelf of the Newark Public Library. Roth recalled, since my family did not own many books, it was good to know that solely by virtue of my citizenship, I had use of any of the books I wanted from the grandly austere building downtown on Washington Street or the branch library I could walk to in my neighborhood. But even more compelling was this idea of communal ownership, property held in common for the common good. So here we have on the left, uh, Roth's favorite author, Tunis, and he loved this book, The Kid from Tompkinsville. Uh, he mentions in at least one of his novels. Uh, here in the center is a grouping that we have on display. It's one of several books that Roth listed were very influential to him during the first half of his life. And, and on the right is, is a note that we found in the scrapbook. His brother, Sandy, also brought back paperbacks from his uh, art school to read. Uh, so one of the books that we found, and we're always finding connections and different markings in books. Uh, one of the books was a Signet paperback by Truman Capote from 1949. And what was interesting that the back, on the very back, um, the reverse of the back cover, it was signed by Ruth Kligman. Uh, Ruth Kligman was an artist who dated Jackson Pollock and also Willem de Kooning, and she attended the Art Students League. So we think that this might have been one of the books that Sandy brought home for Philip to read. Roth attended Chancellor Avenue School, which he loved. He was a very bright child who skipped two grades. He then graduated from Weequaic High School in 1950. We have Roth's autograph book from elementary school on display, as well as his diploma from high school. In the autograph book from 1946, he lists John Tunis as his favorite author. And his motto was, don't step on the underdog. Roth attended Rutgers Newark for one year, during which time he visited the main branch of the Newark Public Library on Washington Street. He described the open stacks to be a mecca, where he discovered books by John Steinbeck, Sherwood Anderson, and Ernest Hemingway. Roth left Newark when he transferred to Bucknell University, and he noted that this was the first time that he was in a non-Jewish environment. He then earned a bachelor's in English. Afterward, he attended the University of Chicago and received a master's in English literature. In 1955, he enlisted in the army but suffered a back injury during training. So he received an honorable discharge. Here it is on the right, is also part of our collection. He returned to the University of Chicago where he was invited to teach and enrolled in a PhD program, but he left after one semester. He began to publish stories in magazines. The first was when he was 25. It was published in Esquire magazine and he was paid $800 for the story. He promptly quit, quit teaching and moved to New York City with his earnings, optimistic that he could make it as a writer, living off $100 a month. And he managed. He then wrote a story that was published in The New Yorker, The Defender of the Faith, which was condemned by offended readers and Jewish organizations who proclaimed that Roth was anti-Semitic. In 1959, he published his first novella, Goodbye Columbus. The main character in the book is a librarian at the Newark Public Library. This work won the National Book Award in 1960. Roth continued to visit Newark and often drove through the neighborhood where he grew up. In 2005, a plaque was placed on his boyhood home at 81 Summit Avenue. And then the corner of Keir and Summit Avenues was renamed Philip Roth Plaza. A ceremony was then held at the Weequaig branch of the Newark Library. 
And when Roth got up to speak, he said, Newark is my Stockholm. This was a reference to not having been received the Nobel Prize. Roth's first full-length novel, Letting Go, was published in 1962. Many of Roth's works are set in Newark. They are works of fiction, but many have details based on real life and explore American identity and assimilation. They offer social commentary and they explore the Jewish experience in America. Roth had fans throughout the world, including President Obama, who read Philip Roth when he was younger and recommended reading Roth to anybody who was new to the country and wanted to learn about fitting in. And perhaps you've heard about The Plot Against America, a book that was recently adapted into a miniseries on HBO. And part of that was also filmed at the library. Several of Roth's works were made into movies. Roth's last novel was Nemesis, a book about a fictional polio epidemic in Newark, which took place in 1944. Roth had wide readership throughout the world. At one time, 50% of his books were sold overseas. His novels have been translated into many languages, including Greek, Japanese, Portuguese, and Croatian. We also have all of those books and are cataloging them now. So we just finished the Italian and Japanese ones, and we're working through the rest of them. There, there are quite a lot of them. Uh, Roth kept these in a closet in one of his bedrooms in his home in Connecticut. So why the Newark Public Library? So as mentioned previously, Roth loved the library. He was impressed by the democratic idea of books being available to all. Roth was always appreciative because not every family could afford books. Later in life, Roth became acquainted with Charles Cummings, who served as a Newark City historian and director of the New Jersey Information Center here at the library. That is the local history room at the Newark Library. Cummings was an invaluable aide providing background information to Roth while he was writing American Pastoral and the Plot Against America. On this photo on the right, Charles Cummings stands in the back. And as I was going through some of the material while processing the books, I came across many envelopes, many of which were still sealed, uh, sent by Charles from the library to Roth, and they contained different articles um, about histories of factories or histories of landmarks in Newark. In 2013, an exhibit that celebrated Roth's 80th birthday was organized at the library. Roth visited unassumingly during evenings. One of our librarians, Jane Seiden, discreetly took this photo of Roth studying one of the floor cases. Roth then wrote this statement explaining why he chose to leave his personal collection to the Newark Public Library. I know there's a lot of text here, so I'm just gonna read a few of these sentences. My decision to locate my personal library in Newark and specifically in the Newark Public Library was determined by a longstanding sense of gratitude to the city where I was born in 1933 and where I was raised in the Weequake section during the middle of the last century. Facing the park on the Northwest side was the grand facade of the main library with its thousands and thousands of books and its gloriously inviting open stacks where you could sit yourself down on the hard floor of a narrow aisle between the walls of shelves and find there in front of you and behind you, above and below you, not only the book you were looking for, but dozens more on the same subject that you'd never heard of. You could sit there gorging on your subject until you couldn't bear any longer being cramped up on the floor and carried off as many books as you could manage to your seat at the table in the reading room. During the first year at Newark Rutgers, during the many hours each day when I didn't have classes, the stacks in the reference room and the reading room of the main library were where I camped out where I wanted a quiet place to alone to read or to study or to look something up. It was my other Newark home, my first other home. Roth, after two spaces were described to him, decided that the room on the second floor of the library next to Centennial Hall, which had been used as storage space for reference books, would be the ideal space for his personal library. Philip Roth died on May 22nd, 2018. 
the library was obligated to complete the project in three years. I'll talk a little bit more about the construction in a few minutes. So part of the initial process involves visiting Roth's two residences, his apartment in New York City and also his home in Connecticut. While the initial estimate was 3,000 books, we quickly came to realize that the actual number was closer to 7,000. These were books that Roth had accumulated from the 1950s up until his death. A visit was made to Roth's apartment and we photographed every single bookshelf because we wanted to document how the books were arranged. When books would later be shelved at the Newark Public Library, they needed to be kept in the same order. And the library was also the designated recipient of Roth's diplomas and awards, some of which were kept in this residence and also inventoried. The majority of the 900 books from the apartment in New York were mainly kept in the bedroom, arranged alphabetically by author's last name. However, you'll see that there are little groupings. So on the left case, all the way on top is where the oversized art and photography books were. And then on the very bottom on that same case, you might recognize the yellow and black spines of two books from the, the dummy series. I believe it was iPhones for dummies and iPad apps for dummies. So we had to keep the same order, but then the shelves got full, so you see Roth began resting books horizontally on top of other books, which weren't necessarily in alphabetical order. So when you visit the library and look at the shelves, there may seem like there are some books misplaced, and that is why. Um, another reason is also that there were books on almost every surface. So trying to keep books in order when they're on top of a coffee table or underneath, um, it gets a little complicated. And then if you notice on the back wall next to the bed, there's a poster. Uh, this is a very unique poster. It is the, I don't think many of these were made. It is the text of every man. And when we visited both residences, there were post-it notes on many different objects indicating who is the designated recipient of those. Um, I don't remember what the post-it note in, on this occasion said, and I couldn't zoom in close enough, but I do know that this poster was recently donated to the collection by Philip Roth's friends, Joel Canaro. I'm not sure if it's the same poster, but it looks very similar and Roth signed it on the bottom corner. So I would like to think that it is. So that is also part of the Newark Library's collection now. The remainder of the books were shelved in the living room or piled on a side table, coffee table or on the floor. I chose to include this photo. It's a side table in the living room because it shows how books were arranged and then some of the objects that Roth kept on display. In the middle is a sketchbook that his brother, from his brother Sandy. Um, and I don't, I don't know why this particular page was of importance, but it shows a sketch of three standing men. And then on the far right, it's a framed piece. And that is a photograph of the Flashner family reunion. Roth was connected to this family through his paternal grandmother. Um, and when he went to a reunion, he recalled as a little boy, he met cousins he never even knew he had. What's very cute about this is that Roth cut out a picture of himself when he was younger, cut it right around his profile, and then he collaged it into the lower right hand corner of the photograph. Um, I'm not sure if you could see it, but we thought it was very interesting. Uh, both of these items that I just talked about, the sketchbook and the photograph are on display in the reading room section of the Philip Roth Personal Library. Afterwards, we spent time in Roth's home in rural Connecticut. Roth spent his summers here writing, the 18th century home was very remote and the property included a writing studio, which was formerly a chicken coop a short distance from the house. 
So here is the main house. Um, it's actually the back of the house that faces the road. And on the left of the house um, is what is a three seasons room. And I will mention that a little bit later on. And to the right of the house is where there was a barn. And that's also where the writing studio was located, just a short walk from there. Every room in the house, and in case you're wondering, even the bathroom, every room in the house had either built-in bookshelves or books piled on the floor or books on tables. Uh, there were built-in bookcases in the guest bedroom, in the den, and the living room. Uh, here is a picture of the guest bedroom. This was mostly drama and poetry. Uh, I'm gonna say, I think a few of these books were Claire Bloom's and other books in this room were inscribed to Claire and Roth. Uh, sometimes I'm asked whether anybody helped Roth organize his library. My understanding is that a librarian at the public library in Litchfield, Connecticut did, as well as a scholar during one summer. Uh, many of Roth's honorary diplomas were hanging in a hallway upstairs. He received many accolades throughout his life, including the Pulitzer National Book Award, International Booker Prize, National Humanities Medal, and those are just to name a few. On the right is the den downstairs. Again, built-in bookshelves. Uh, this contained works of fiction, and there were also books on right in front of the fireplace and a few others on the floor. In the back of the house, Roth had converted a room into what we call a library room. Um, it was difficult to take a comprehensive shot of the entire room because there were just so many shelves and books. So I just went in there and took pictures of every, every single shelf. Um, in this room were the kinds of metal shelves that you would see at a public library, the same kind of shelves that we have here at the Newark Library. Uh, this room alone held about 2,500 books. These were all nonfiction. They were organized for the most part alphabetically by author's last name. If it was a biography of the person, the last name of the person would be shelved alphabetically with the others. Uh, but then there were some specific groupings. So there were groupings on baseball, Jewish studies. Um, in the back of the room, there was one bookcase full of Roth's first editions and some, some that he had inscribed to his parents. And there was a large section of art books as well. Um, I like to tell the story that it was in this room that I somehow missed it on my first visit, found it on the second visit. There was a printer box on the floor. I don't remember if it was a Dell or HP printer. I didn't think much of it. In Roth's own handwriting, in masking tape, it said printer. When we opened it, that's where we discovered the seven scrapbooks that his mother had put together uh, for some of his novels. So those contained um, clippings and reviews that she found from newspapers all across the world. We have one of those on display in the Philip Roth reading room. And here on the right is an interior shot of the writing studio. So you could see that had a fireplace. It also had a bedroom in the back and it was um, a very quiet place to work. Um, that's where he had a table, a computer and also a standing writing desk. Here is where Roth kept research material. So we were able to figure out that many of these books uh, were used for writing The Plot Against America and Nemesis. Uh, there are books on politics, Lindbergh and polio in this section. And when you visit the Philip Roth Personal Library, there are five elevations of bookshelves. Uh, so when we started shelving, we started at shelving in the elevation that faces the gallery space. So first the books from New York, and then followed by the books that were in the writing studio. Um, so when you're looking at that area, just to the left of the pass-through into the reading room, you'll see these books that are shown here on the photograph. 
The writing studio also contained a collection of Roth's medals, a trestle table, Roth's standing desk, and one of his Eames chairs. Um, these are all designated to the library and they are also on view. I mentioned the Three Seasons room before. So here is a picture of the interior of that room. And here is what we call the harvest table. Uh, most of the furniture in Roth's home is very simple, just a shaker style. Uh, this table was given to us. It is now the centerpiece of the reading room that you see here on the right. Uh, so basically the way the room is organized is one third is uh, a reading room and that's where researchers work and the rest of the space just through that doorway and the doorway does close with a sliding glass barn door. Uh, the other space is the exhibition area, which is always open. While the library was given three years to construct the Philip Roth Personal Library, it took time before Roth's residences were put on the market and Therefore, the Roth estate wanted to keep the books in place until the residences were sold. So things did not happen right, right away. Uh, we didn't receive authorization to transfer the books until quite some time later. The 900 books from Roth's apartment in New York City were moved to Newark in late summer of 2019. So that's over a year after uh, Roth's death. And then those in Connecticut, about 6,000 books were removed during the COVID-19 pandemic in July of 2021. So that was over two years after his death, leaving less than a year to process and to catalog those 6,000 books. The library was also given Roth's LP collection, two academic robes, and other items such as radios, posters, and a collection of cassette tapes, some of which contain interviews. The books, furniture, and other items were transported to the New York Public Library and placed in a storage room. Although the library was closed during the pandemic, certain staff were permitted to work on the project. This entailed first processing the books and then cataloging them. So the books had to be kept in the same order. So when they were put into the boxes, everything was shelf by shelf. We know exactly which shelf everything was on, which room things were in. Um, and then going through the books and just taking out all the loose items we found inside took a long time. So, for example, if a book had a post-it note in it, um, I would photocopy the page to show where the post-it note was, carefully remove the post-it, put it into an archival sleeve, um, and then I would file it into a corresponding folder, and then I created a collection, an archival collection with all those materials. So staff worked on this time consuming project from August of 2020 through May of 2021. So I mentioned that the room that the Philip Roth Personal Library is in was a storage room for, uh, for, for books. So the room first had to be cleared out, the shelves were removed, and then months and months of construction work ensued. It was very, very tedious. Um, and just some, just some of the basic projects included removing the drop ceiling, taking out the floor tiles, refinishing the wood floor that we found underneath, installing, we later learned that we had to install a steel beam underneath the floor to support the weight of the books and the bookshelves. Um, and removed the plaster pilasters and the wood paneling. We took down the obtrusive HVAC ductwork that was in the ceiling, and we installed a brand new HVAC system and we put in track lighting. Uh, this was laborious. And while a lot of work was accomplished while the library was closed due to the pandemic, we also experienced scheduling setbacks due to back orders and shipping delays. Uh, so on the photo here on the left is how the room looked after the floor tiles were removed. Uh, and then you could see that some of the woodwork paneling just below the windows had been removed, exposing um, you see the brickwork behind there. Uh, and then in the upper left hand corner near the ceiling in that photo, you could see that HVAC ductwork that I was talking about. So all of that had to be removed. 
And here is basically the same angle on the right here. The room is completed and the windows are on the right side there. And you can see the, the beautiful floor. Well, it had to be refinished, but that was the floor that we found underneath the tiles. On the left is a photograph of the room uh, before we really started any work. So we had just started taking out the shelves. Uh, I still see some tables and parts of shelves there. Um, you could see the, a, the duct work running all along the ceiling on the right side of the photo. Um, and that wasn't even the worst of it. So there was that. And then on the far side, we call it the Eastern wall. There were two other large HVAC units. Those had to be taken down as well. And, and the fluorescent lighting, and then you see the drop ceiling in that photograph. On the right is a picture of that same elevation. That's the east side. Um, there's, there are the bones of the building, basically. We uh, discovered two doorways that we had to patch over, and you could see that those, all that HVAC equipment had been taken down, and so was the drop ceiling. So you could see what the ceiling underneath of that looked like. And here it is that two more pictures of that same elevation, the east wall. So you could see the wall is being put back. There's still those two doorway openings on the bottom. And that is the same wall on the right here once the plaster pilasters were put back, which provided these great sections that we, we colored in between and we put different quotes by Roth um, all over that wall. So Ann Beha Architects and Shamut Design and Construction handled the renovation and CNG partners were responsible for the graphics and exhibition design and Hadley exhibits installed the floor cases and the bookshelves. The bookshelves were custom made by Hadley exhibits in Buffalo and they were transported here and they were so tall they need to be carried up the stairs. To explain it in a brief way, every section needed to be secured to a wall. Hardware was installed, then the glass doors, and then LED lighting. And this was happening at the same time that the exhibit was being installed on the opposite side of the room. The construction was completed during the second week of May, and subsequently, a large portion of the collection, 3,700 books, many of which contain marginalia or presentation copies to Roth, were shelved as they were in Roth's homes, room by room, shelf by shelf. And the remainder of the books, mostly encyclopedias, journals, or duplicate copies of books or books that don't have any marking, are kept in an adjacent storage room. So I should also explain that it was a very time consuming endeavor and we didn't have much time. Uh, normally library books come in and we put labels on them, we put barcodes on them, do we decimal and we shelve them in that order. We couldn't do that with these books. So there was a dilemma and what we decided to do was um, carefully mark in pencil on the back of every one the reverse of the back page, uh, the barcodes to all the books and every book got an item number as well. And then we inserted an archival book slip with the barcode and the label, which then went into an archival Myler slip into the back of the book. So when you're looking at the books on the shelves, you won't see any adhesives, any labels on them and all the identifying information is in the back. So then how do you find a book? This was another dilemma. So after the books were cataloged, all of them have been cataloged except the foreign ones that we're working on now. You will see in the notes field for every catalog record, which room the books were found in, whether they contain any marginalia. It won't be specific, so it won't say on which pages the marginalia is on. Um, it'll mention if it's a presentation copy and if there was any accompanying material found inside of the book, it'll tell you what corresponding file in the Philip Roth collection you would find those materials. And 
So again, it's room by room, there's no labels. And basically there, there's a key to where all the, all the books are located. But we aren't completely done. We have boxes of foreign editions that we're still cataloging, as well as interviews that we have converted from audio cassette and VHS tapes. And we're now transcribing those, so that will take a while. The Philip Roth inaugural exhibition highlights items from the collection and it's arranged thematically. I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to two of our trustees, Timothy Christ and Rosemary Steinbaum, who helped curate the exhibit for their expertise and guidance. The exhibit is intended as an introduction to Philip Roth. A visitor can learn about Roth's connection to Newark and its library, about his influence throughout the world, and about his writing process. We've selected 10 topics. These include baseball, fellow writers, Roth's teacher, and even camp. During future presentations, I will discuss some of the wonderful items that we have on display. These include the National Humanities Medal, President Obama awarded Roth, the Pulitzer Prize, a letter Roth sent to his parents warning them about publicity and calls they might be getting about Zuckerman Bound, a letter Roth's father sent him urging him to cut his hair. We have two such letters, a selection of Roth's notes and typescripts, uh, and even a letter Roth wrote to a summer romance he met at camp. This letter was recently donated by, to us by its recipient, along with some other letters and, and a very cute list that Roth wrote to his romance, recommending her what to read so that she can become an intellectual. In the reading room, other objects adorn bookshelves and are on permanent display. One of Roth's typewriters, we have three of them, so we have one on display. Saul Bellow's top hat, presentation copies by others to Roth, other examples of books that have marginalia and much more. However, I encourage you to visit and to see it for yourself. The in-person experience just can't be substituted with an online presentation. The exhibition is always open during regular library hours. The Philip Roth Library is a prominent example of a personal library kept by a greatly accomplished novelist and a cultivated reader. To the best of our knowledge, only a few personal libraries of major American authors have been preserved in the entirety for the edification of the public. The reading room is usually open from 10 to three, uh, but appointments are required if you wanna see a book. Um, so whenever somebody is staffing the reading room, it's usually open. I do suggest just sending an email to us. I'll mention that at the end of the presentation to make sure that somebody is there. So as I explained earlier, there are two spaces in the room. The exhibition gallery is always open. The reading room is open when somebody is staffing the room. Um, the Philip Roth Personal Library will enable the library and the city to become an important global literary destination. Additionally, this gift will enable the library to create stimulating programs to engage new workers and to encourage the next generation of aspiring writers. Please mark your calendars for our annual Philip Roth lecture on November 4th at 6 p.m. featuring Ayad Akhtar, author of Homeland Elegies. Akhtar's identity as a writer was influenced by others, including Philip Roth. And then on November 16th at 4 p.m., we will be revisiting the Yeshiva Conference of 1962. This program, organized by William Connell, who's an Andrew Carnegie Fellow at Seton Hall University, will feature a panel discussion of distinguished scholars speaking out about each of the three writers who were present at the lecture in 1962, uh, Ralph Ellison, Philip Roth, and Pietro Di Donato. On Roth, there will be uh, Elaine Showalter and Stephen Zipperstein, on Ellison, John Callahan and Sterling Bland, and on Dino Nato, Mary Jo Bona and Fred Gardafay, and that will be an in-person event here at the library.
So please continue to check the website for more information and I encourage you to become a friend of the Philip Roth Personal Library. Information is always available on the website prpl at npl.org. I am aware that because of a firewall that we have in place for security issues, you may have trouble accessing the site. Um, so therefore, I encourage you to follow one of our social media accounts, either Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And the email here, prpl at npl.org, if you ever have any questions about anything that's in the collection, or if there's a question that I can't get to tonight, or if you think of a question later on, I will, I will get back to you usually within a day. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future as we continue to explore the Philip Roth Personal Library. Uh, we will post this information on our social media accounts as soon as the next program is scheduled. And this, as I mentioned earlier, will be available for viewing at any time since it is being recorded. Um, I'm going to close the program now and open it up for questions. Okay, so let's see. I'm reading through comments. Give me one second. Um, why three years after his death? And if not completed, what would have happened to his collection? Um, that was a, the agreement made by the trust. It was a legal agreement. And if we hadn't completed it, it would have gone to another institution. And then why were the shelves not constructed locally? Well, there were bits put out for the whole process. So the designers that were working with us, uh, then they bid out to a museum fabrication company. And as bids go, the ones that they selected where it was a company that was in, in Buffalo. I answered those two. Okay. And please feel free to type any other questions in the chat. Um, has the writer Lisa Scottoline, who has identified Roth as an influence during her years at Penn, been scheduled to speak as Roth as a teacher? No, we do include the, the piece that she wrote in the New York Times in one of the exhibition cases, uh, but no, not yet. Did Roth put any conditions on the, how the books were displayed or if you had to keep every book? Um, I don't think there was anything specific about how the books were displayed. We definitely had to keep all of the books. We didn't go into details about um, how many books would fit into a certain area. So when the designers created the space, um, we knew that there wasn't enough room for all 7,000 books. So some, a few of those were put in storage, but no, there was nothing that specific. Are there any other questions? Let me see. Are there any restrictions on copying marginalia or other material related to, to the books? Uh, yes, I should mention that as well. So Roth, uh, the agreement very clearly says, um, only handwritten notes allowed, no photocopying and no photographing of marginalia. So uh, that is a little hard to control, but researchers who use any of the books are requested to take notes and I have to monitor to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, however, we do, we do have other collections. So we have uh, materials that Roth's friend Joel Canaro donated. Those are scrapbooks and then some typescripts and there are no restrictions on those. Uh, do you know where in Connecticut he lived? 
Uh, yeah, I went by various names. So right near Litchfield, it was Warren, Connecticut, uh, earlier in the day known as uh, Cornwall Bridge. So I found some envelopes that didn't even have an address. It just said Philip Raw, Cornwall Bridge, Connecticut. Who funded the project? So I should mention that the money that Roth donated to the library was intended for the purchase of new materials. So none of that was used in the construction. So that was all, all we had, the library had to do a lot of fundraising to pay for the construction of the Philip Roth Personal Library. Are individuals able to take books from the shelves to handle? Um, so you would, um, all the books are behind glass. If there's a particular book you'd wanna see, you'd have to let me know a week ahead of time because the shelf, some of the shelves are 12 feet high. So it takes a while to try to get some of the books out. Um, so I would pull the books out for you and then you could sit at the harvest table and then you could look at them. All very good questions. I should have mentioned the one about the marginalia before. Um, that you read somewhere that Roth had lived on Leslie Street in Newark. Do we know the street number? Um, I'm, I'm aware he lived on Leslie Street off the top of my hand. I don't remember the street number, but I could get back to you if you want to um, send me an email at PR, prpl at npl.org. Are there a lot of researchers that come to look at the books? I think it's been slower than we would like because one, because of the pandemic, and then it's summertime and people are traveling. It's also been very hot out. Um, so a few people have, um, some people have spent more, more than one day, a, 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 few, a handful have, yes. Are there any conferences planned to be held in the library area and will exhibitions change? Um, so the initial thought was that the exhibition that is out in the gallery sp space would change about after a year or so. Um, so we're, we're st still thinking about that, but in the future that will change. Uh, but the objects that we have displayed in the reading room shelves, um, those will be there permanently. Um, and then regarding conferences, um, just the, the Roth lecture that I mentioned, then that symposium on November 16th, um, and that, that's really all for now. There's, there's something else in the works, but um, I think we're, we're still developing that. You'll hear that in a little bit. Okay. Did you see this one? Okay, how extensive? Uh, okay. Oh, how extensive is the collection of Roth's handwritten notes, and has it helped scholars understand his writing process? Um, the notes are really everywhere. So this would be <laughs> this would be a separate presentation just on the notes. Um, so there would be sticky notes in books. So for example, Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer is on display. That one might have had 30, 35 sticky notes in it. Um, I think Roth went through phases. So first it was sticky notes, um, then it was loose, loose pages in books. Sometimes it was um, yellow ruled paper that he wrote notes on and stuck inside the books. Um, then for a while he was underlining, starring, writing marginalia. And then what's interesting, those pages, he would then write in the first page of the book, the page numbers, almost like a table of contents to the notes that he put in the book, along with other, other little thoughts. Um, so for some of the books, um, there's quite a few pages and especially for his own works, we found a lot. Um, not only because he was teaching his works, um, but also 
he was constantly revising. So even after one of his books was published, he would still go into it and make additional changes. And sometimes he did that in more than one copy with different comments. Um, and and a lot of a lot of notes, and I think a lot of drafts. I I, I think I believe I heard that he had destroyed or he burned in his in the backyard of his Connecticut home because one time I was asked how many different versions are there how many different typescripts for a certain book and the answer is I really don't know we have a few but the writing was constantly evolving so one time I found a a loose sheet and I was trying to figure out what book it corresponded to and there was only one word that I could match up in the later version so constantly editing changing adjectives. It was really incredible. Okay. And then, oh, I'm sorry, the, the second part of that question was whether it had, um, whether the notes have helped scholars understand his writing process. Um, well, there are other collections too. So there are collections at like the Library of Congress, for example. So I think a scholar would have to make um, multiple visits and consult um, different items. I should also mention that we found notes on the backs of book jackets. There was one that I missed the first time going around. And just one time I opened a flap and I saw writing on the inside. So. I had to go through every single book and sometimes I found notes on spines. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes those notes corresponded with the books and sometimes they were outlines or notes he was making for books that he was writing. So for example, we have um, on display The Nightmare Decade by Fred Cook and that has notes on the inside um, and you could recognize it right away. Um, talks about Rita. It talks about Jesse, and it's for um, for one of his novels. I'm sorry. There were there were three of those. So there were three. So one was History Wars, and that's where I found Rita and Jesse, and that was for American Pastoral. And then the notes on the other book I just mentioned were for I Married a. Uh, what is my favorite object? There are so many great ones. Um, I think I would have to list a few. I really like the letters from his father. Um, his father was afraid that in the 70s with Roth's appearance that he was, he was, if he was walking around New York City, something would happen to him. Somebody would want to beat him up for the way he looked. And the letter basically says, son, you know, I love you so much, but you really have to cut your hair because your appearance matters. And I do also really love the scrapbooks that his mother put together because she clipped the reviews so carefully and they're placed so evenly in the book. And every single one has a citation by her. And there, were, I, there was even at least one um, I think that was from a newspaper in Israel and she translated the, the whole title. So those were very interesting. If there are no other questions, we're gonna end the program. I hope you found it to be informative. I think these were, were great questions. If you think of any other questions, please make sure to email me. Again, my name is Nadine and the email is prpl at npl.org. And I'm hoping in future presentations to talk more about the marginalia, uh, some of the objects and the exhibit cases and just much more. Thank you.